The Nuke Plant Bailout and Larry Householder make their State House returns. <music> Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Herb Asher, OSU political scientist, Jesse Balmert, State House reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer, and Clarence Mingo, former Franklin County auditor. The bitter political fight we thought was over is back. Lawmakers are once again debating whether two nuclear power plants in northern Ohio should receive a government mandated billion dollar bailout. It's back because federal prosecutors say the bailout, also known as House Bill 6, is at the center of a $61 million bribery scandal. Many lawmakers want to repeal the tainted law and replace it with something else. House Speaker Bob Cup has named a committee to come up with a plan to do just that. Other lawmakers and advocates want to repeal the whole thing immediately. Jesse Balmer, just exactly how excited are lawmakers to have to deal with this again? <laughs> well, it depends. If you didn't like House Bill 6 to begin with, you are certainly happy to potentially get rid of it this time around. But if you were a longtime supporter, if you thought that the subsidies for renewable energy and energy efficiency were too high, um, I don't think you're ready to have this conversation again, but it's also you have this poll of the $61 million investigation and the allegations attached to that in the speaker. And so I think it's just an uncomfortable conversation for everybody at the state house right now. Tell us about this committee, Jesse, that, that Speaker Cup has formed. It seems fair. Democrats, Republicans, supporters, opponents of this of this law. Uh, is that what the feeling uh, on the floor of the house that they think it's a fair committee at least? So the breakdown is interesting. There's about five people who supported House Bill 6. There are about eight people who opposed House Bill 6. And then two lawmakers who weren't even here when House Bill 6 was going through the first time, which might be smart. You're getting a fresh look on the thing. I thought it was interesting. I think a new committee could be potentially helpful. You're getting a fresh set of eyes on the issue. Uh, you compare that to the Senate, which it's going through the same committee that House Bill 6 went through over there, the effort to repeal. And so you see some of the same lines that you saw when the bill passed the first time last year. Clarence Mingo, committees can be good. They can get things done. You can be productive. They can bring out perspectives you may not have thought of. Committees, as longtime government watchers also know, can be a place where things die, way to stall, way to avoid things. Clarence Mingo, what do you think it is here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Speaker Cup is really the linchpin here. Uh, he has the, the opportunity to, to demonstrate to the public um, and also the Republican caucus that uh, a new era uh, free of scandal has begun in the Ohio General Assembly. And so if he is committed to retaining and then building public confidence in our legislative system, he will ensure that this committee does bipartisan work um, and produces outcomes that will ensure the public can believe in the processes we have in place to ensure the public welfare. So um, Speaker Cup is the linchpin and uh, he was voted as the speaker because he is a man of integrity and has lived so as a public servant. So we'll be watching closely to see if he you know, continues to be who he has been in other uh, public offices. Um, but I think the, the momentum in, in, in history by way of his own conduct, I think gives us good indication um, that things will progress and this committee will do bipartisan work and down the road restore uh, public confidence uh, in our uh, legislative processes and the General Assembly as a whole. Now, Speaker um, Cup has not in any way been linked to the scandal. Uh, but he did vote for House Bill 6, and he has received political donations, his campaign has, from First Energy. Herb Asher, how do you see this playing out? Do you see them? Oh. I mean, it's, it's odd to hear repeal and replace associated with something besides Obamacare, <laughs> first of all. But, and the, the opponents of this, the people who have opposed this law from the get-go, want it immediately repealed. Yeah, and the Senate president has already indicated that that might be the simplest thing to do simply repeal it and then leave the replace question perhaps even for the next general assembly elected this november because the replace question could really bring up a whole variety of issues including what is what should be the optimal energy policy for the state of ohio 
Uh, and so I think uh, repeal is uh, one thing, but then what do you do after that? And I think there are a lot of questions about what's the role of nuclear? What's the re role of renewables? Uh, you know, remember this House Bill 6 also bails out two coal plants, one in Ohio, one in Indiana. So the easy part is to repeal it. The, uh, it'll have some consequences in those communities that have the nuclear plants, but then the more difficult policy question is, what should the policy for the state of Ohio be in terms of the mix of energy sources that would be best for the state? And I'm not sure they're gonna get that done uh, in the remaining parts of the session. And that might be an argument to say, do an immediate repeal if that's what you wind up doing, but then set the agenda for next year that we're coming back to see what do we replace it with. Jesse Bauman, of course, we're, we're two months from the election and some of these Republican lawmakers who voted for HB6, who voted for Speaker Householder, they don't want this to be an issue during the campaign. It's going to be, but it would be easier for them if they were to just repeal it right away. They could say, look, it was tainted. We got rid of it. We're going to start over next year. What is the thinking of the election and, the, and the, how that is influencing uh, this debate, Jesse, uh, on the House floor? It's interesting because there's an outside group that's running some ads saying that they need to repeal immediately. And it has various backers um, ranging from energy groups to uh, conservative organizations. So that's been interesting. But the Democrats themselves are focusing on bribery, not on this piece of legislation. They're not focusing on energy policy. They're not really focusing on the election of uh, Speaker Householder. And that could be in part because some Democrats did support House Bill 6 and some Democrats supported Speaker Householder's election. So I, I, this doesn't break down on traditional partisan lines. I do think there was some pressure from certain unions to support this piece of legislation because of the jobs and the good paying jobs that were associated with it at the nuclear plants. And so that got a few people on board. It, it's an interesting bill because people supported it for many, many different reasons. Yeah, the jobs issue, opponents point to the, I mean, that's supporters of HB6 say it saved thousands of jobs because these plants didn't shut down. And of course the, the associated industries and businesses near the plants were not affected and those jobs were saved. But opponents say, we don't know for sure that was going to happen. Clarence Mingo, one of the things they want is they want First Energy or Energy Harbor, which is now the, what the name of the subsidiary is, to release its books, to prove us, prove to us that you need this $1 billion bailout. Do you think Representative or Speaker Cup's committee will demand that as they explore replacing House Bill 6? Well, two, two part answer there. Um, like, I'm, I'm not sure how you know, they, they cannot um, you know, take the steps and, and the actions that will demonstrate the maximum level of concern, um, internal control, um, and due process around uh, HB6. So this has to be very transparent. And I think if you look carefully at what Speaker Cup has said, um, it, it, it will be. I think that that point, the need for transparency is certainly understood. What concerns me and what we really have not seen around the repeal of, of House uh, Bill 6 is uh, the public awareness and understanding as to what this is really about. Keep in mind, we're, we're battling a pandemic. The nation is on fire with respect to race relations. This is undoubtedly the most critical presidential election uh, in modern American history. And I don't believe that Ohioans uh, have fully perceived and understood what House Bill 6 uh, is about what the consequence of it is. And because of that, there has not been uh, the type of public outcry and outrage that I would have expected to see about this type of scandal uh, in Ohio government. So I, my hope is that um, greater awareness and knowledge as we get closer to election day will abound with respect to the public understanding what House Bill 6 is about, why the repeal matters, and what the future should be for Ohio utilities. Well, Larry Householder went a long way this week towards reminding Ohioans about this scandal because not wanting to miss the chance to participate in the legislative process, indicted state rep and former speaker Larry Householder was back on the House floor this week. In the United States, we believe that you're innocent until you're proven guilty. And that day has not come. And so uh, I am innocent. I am going to defend myself vigorously. 
A day later, Householder pleaded not guilty at his arraignment in federal court. He says he does not want to cause any problems, but current Speaker Cup called the appearance offensive and renewed his call for Larry Householder to resign. Clarence Mingo, what did you make of his appearance on the House floor? I guess it wasn't terribly surprising given Larry Householder's personality. I think, I think you're right. Certainly not, not terrible, surprising, but I, I think that this is part of a broader trend that's happening in American politics where, um, you know, in, in the midst of, uh, you know, very substantive investigations where the public trust and welfare is at stake, we now have politicians who are willing uh, to prove how incredulous they can be, um, you know, while, while facing very serious and, and difficult circumstances. Look, I'm, uh, I'm an attorney and I appreciate the concept of, uh, you know, not, not guilty until proven otherwise. That's just good basic American jurisprudence. Uh, and a lot of things are lawful, but that doesn't mean they are wise. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the speaker pushed the boundaries of, of in terms of you know, what, what incredulous behavior is. Um, I think if Republicans could do a rewind um, and insist uh, that he not appear uh, on state house grounds or, or anywhere near the General Assembly, I'm, I'm sure they would. Let me call that a bad day uh, for the Republican Party and for Republican legislators. The tragedy is that no one could stop it or no one had the influence to do so. Yeah, the House, the, there was an effort to remove him from the House, but according to House rules, they cannot, they can only expel a representative once for one reason. They didn't want to do that because Householder is up for re-election uh, in a couple of months. He will take his seat, assuming he wins. He's a heavy favorite. Assuming he wins, he'll, he'll be back in January, and they could not expel him then. Herb Asher, he also said that, talking about the House Bill 6 uh, investigation, quote, things got a little wild with House Bill 6, uh, but that's <laughs> politics sometimes. <laughs> Downplaying a $61 million bribery investigation, to say the yeah. least. Uh, he reminded me last week of the President of the United States, who has no sense of shame or embarrassment. And certainly Larry Householder showing up at the legislature, that is an, that's incredibly arrogant, shows no concern about your colleagues, uh, and not just your Republican colleagues, but your Democratic colleagues, and no concern about the institution. I think Speaker Cup got it exactly right. And now you have to face the issue, what happens when he in fact gets reelected? And uh, there he is back in January. Uh, will the House, which can, is the judge of its own members, you know, will they in fact seat him or not seat him? And uh, I'm not sure you can count upon Larry to be a quiet, passive backbencher <laughs> So they're going to have to face this issue. Uh, and of course, if he's found, you know, and the, well, the court proceedings are taking a long time. If he's found guilty, that takes care of it. But that's going to be, you know, a long time. And if he's found innocent, it's, it's going to be, you know, that'll take care of it. So they now have a problem. And that problem will be a constant reminder. But I think as someone said just before, boy, they wish he would at least disappear for the next 60 days. You know, the GOP. The, and actually, the whole legislature doesn't need him to remind people that there was a major scandal here in Ohio. I think Democrats will be reminding people. But Jesse yeah. Bobbitt, I'm curious. I would imagine there was quite a bit of social distancing around Larry Householder this week when it comes to other representatives, other members of the House, particularly GOP members. You know, it really depends on who you are. I think you you heard the comments from Speaker Cup, so he's certainly going to distance him. I mean, you got to feel for the guy. It's his first full session, and he has to deal with his predecessor sitting there holding court with the Ohio Press Corps. So, so there's that. Yeah. Um, but there are other members who are still supportive of Larry Householder. There are other members who are still close with him, and they'll tell you innocent until proven guilty. And to everyone's point, certainly that is true. Uh, but there's also what is helpful. There's a lot of Republicans who are in tight seats who don't need the figure of a federal investigation sitting right next to them. Jesse, are there, is there any indication, say Larry Householder wins re-election, is sworn in again as a rep next January, is there an indication that an expulsion vote would come then? Have, have lawmakers talked about that? I don't think we have a good sense of that, but I don't know how much different it would be from what happened this last time around. I think a lot of people think that if he isn't convicted, if he isn't 
found guilty that he should be able to continue to serve. And that federal investigation could take quite a while. His attorneys, he's got new attorneys this week, and they told uh, mm -hmm. Cleveland.com that they are not interested in a plea bargain. They want to go to trial. Of course, attorneys always say that when they come on a case, so we'll, we'll see what that turns out. After leveling off for a couple of weeks, uh, new Ohio COVID cases have jumped up again. Officials blame the increase on the return of college students to campuses around the state. Here in Columbus, Ohio State University reports more than 1,000 students have tested positive. Ohio saw a sharp increases in cases after the 4th of July holiday. And Governor DeWine pleads with Ohioans to be careful over the Labor Day holiday. What we do this weekend uh, will really determine what our fall is going to look like. And we've got a lot at stake. Uh, we've got kids back in school. We've got college kids back in school. Um, we've got a lot of things going for us in Ohio, and we do not want to turn back. See, Bob, I'll send this, this one to you. The, it, it, no coincidence, all the college students came back to campus. They're living close together. They're being college students. They're going to parties. The cases jump up in Columbus and Oxford, places like that. It's true. I mean, and I think universities are trying very hard to implement policies to keep students separated and require masks and have various pledges and promises and so forth. But it's just a large increase in the number of people. You take a place like Oxford, Ohio, and where Miami University is, that you know greatly increases the population of Butler County in that area. And so it's just an infusion of more people who are interacting with one another who are, you know, potentially spreading the disease. I think um, one good sign is there haven't been a lot of hospitalizations or ICU cases in that younger population, but certainly that's an opportunity for people to spread the disease yeah. to other individuals. Um Early this summer, college age people made up about 10% of the new COVID cases we were seeing every day. Now they make up 35% of the new COVID cases. Again, further evidence that the spread right now is among young people. Herb Asher, you worked closely with high level college administrators in the past. Should colleges have brought students back, put them in dorms? Uh, I'd say yes, under very, very restrictive circumstances. I would give Ohio State a lot of credit on two levels here. One, they've been very, very transparent about providing information to the press in terms of number of cases, number of hospitalizations. Uh, Ohio State also has done a very good job of trying to have uh, uh, places where you can either isolate or quarantine students. You wonder if in fact they're going to be able to, they're going to exceed their capacity to do that. Uh, they've had, you know, very good very, you know, health messages going out. So they're doing everything right. And, and yet, you know, we'll see whether in fact this actually can, can work. But I think at some point you need to at least try to see if you can get back to some degree of normalcy. And I think Ohio State's doing everything right right now. And if it doesn't work out at Ohio State, that'll make me pessimistic about a lot of other places that don't have the resources that Ohio State has, including an extensive medical center and healthcare facilities and capacity to house students who are ill and all of that. But as somebody just said, you know, there haven't been a lot of hospitalizations yet, and there hasn't there haven't been really a lot of indications of anything really serious in terms of illness yet. But you know, next week the numbers could be much worse. And then if we start seeing hospitalizations increasing and serious uh, side effects, uh, you know, maybe then the experiment will fail. But I'd give Ohio State credit for doing this, not on, not on the cheap. I mean, they have invested a lot of money to try to make this right. And they're doing the testing, they're doing the monitoring, and uh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Clarence Mingo, one of the things that came out this week is that masks apparently work. Uh, an analysis by the Cincinnati Enquirer found that in the first three weeks under the mask order, the seven-day average of new cases in counties where the masks were mandated fell by 35 percent. Cases fell by 35 percent. The rest of the state that did not mandate masks, they went up by 4 percent. Not a huge number, but, you know, combined, it's a 40 percent difference. Is the debate over mask wearing finally over, Clarence, do you think? I, I don't think it is um, at all. 
uh, I think the the believe it or not the it, maybe not surprisingly the, the presidential election um, and the president himself uh, is is fueling that debate in part and and it's uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing that that the health of Americans as individuals can almost be tied back to which party they are aligned with. Uh, there, there are uh, there's a truckload of data available that suggests if you are strongly conservative and Republican, you are less inclined to wear a mask. Counterwise, if you are Democrat and, and very liberal, you are more inclined yeah. to wear a mask. And, um, that, you know, there's sort of a, a political perspective surrounding this, uh, I, I think is a peculiar circumstance for Americans to face. Um, I would also say uh, Dr. Fauci was right, right? Uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, uh, Dr. Amy Acton, uh, former Department of, uh, of uh, Ohio Health Director, and many other experts, both uh, in-state and external to Ohio, uh, stated long ago that masks, in the most basic form of, um, you know, preventative defense against uh, this virus uh, is the highest and best thing we can do. All right, and, we got, um, Clarence, we're going so to get to our for fourth top responsibility to, want, to continue on. The data you just cited proves that mass work works. They are effective, uh, and we should all gravitate towards that and expect to live this way. Yep. Uh, for the remainder of this uh, pandemic. All right, we're going to get to our last topic while we can. We have to talk about the presidential race, of course. While we're all coping with the daily effects of the global pandemic, President Trump has effectively focused the 2820 campaign on protest and so-called law and order issues. Both candidates this week traveled to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where a police shooting of a black man sparked protest, fires and looting. The two visits had different tones. This should never happen. A thing like this should never happen. Regardless how angry you are, if you loot or you burn, you should be held accountable as someone who does anything else, period. I honest to God believe we have an enormous opportunity. Now that the, the screen, the, the, the curtain's been pulled back on just what's going on in the country to do a lot of really positive things. We have about two minutes left here, Herb, to get our final thoughts on this presidential campaign. Joe Biden had to go to Wisconsin. He wants to talk about the pandemic, but he had to go to Wisconsin. Did he help or hurt himself by going there this week? Oh, I think he helped himself. And I think he pointed out the contrast between his approach and Donald Trump's approach. And I think uh, Biden certainly now is making sure he condemns violence and all of that. But he's also saying we can do better as a country. And I think that becomes very, very important. I think at some point, uh, the law and order emphasis that Trump is doing, which is remindful of Willie Horton, which is remindful of uh, Richard Nixon and the silent majority, and remindful of actually George Wallace, I'm not sure it has the same play that it today that it did in the past. And I think at some point, you know, more people will say, well, wait a second, Trump is continuing to divide us. Trump is, make, is making us all very tired making us all very weary or whatever. And Biden, I think, if he can stay strong on message, but also present an image or a view of America that's a little bit more positive and optimistic, I think we'll be able to win the votes of key people he needs to become the president. Clarence Mingo, one minute left. Are Americans buying this argument that the country would be safer under a second Trump administration and more in danger? if Joe Biden were to become president? I don't know if they believe the country would be more endangered if Joe Biden became president, but I do think the message uh, about law and, and order uh, in a higher measure of civil, dis in a higher measure of civil obedience and responsible protesting is, is resonating right now. And that's something Democrats are gonna have to um, contend with. Quickly, back to Professor Asher's point, um, the public may be growing tired of President Trump, but he is not a man to be uh, underestimated. Uh, he has proven time and time again to, to be rather uh, rather, you know, impervious to the trends that typically sink most politicians. President Trump has managed to survive, so Joe Biden needs to stay on message, continue to talk unity, and uplift the nation as he did this week in Wisconsin. All right, it's time now for our weekly off-the-record parting shots. Clarence Mingo, you're first. Listen, we have to think and be smart as we approach this uh, election. Vote wisely and with wisdom. All right. Herb Asher, your final thought. Uh, unlike what the president suggested in North Carolina, uh, only vote once. 
No, President, no, he, did he really say vote twice or just go and check your vote? No, he actually said uh, <laughs> cast your vote and cast an absentee, and then cast your absentee ballot and then go to the polls. That's right. Well, we'll see what, we'll, yes, vote once. We, we can all agree on that. We'll just, we'll just <laughs> vote once. Jesse Ballmer. A very, a very brave thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Ballmer. Yes. Going off Herb's comment, my colleague Dan Horn took a look at how many people tried to vote more than once, and there are about 2,000 over the past three presidential elections, which was less than 0.01% of all voters. So uh, just don't do it. You also wonder how many of those folks just plain forgot that they already voted or how it was intentional. I mean, who, who knows why people voted twice? Some were probably up to no good, but anyway. Uh, my prediction is that the next battle in COVID-19, and it will be a battle, trust me, even though it is a holiday that really is suitable to mask wearing, the next battle will be over Halloween and trick or treating. Usually I complain that suburbs don't trick or treat on Halloween, they have beggars nights for whatever reason, which is socialism run amok. Towns and cities are gonna to have to decide if they're gonna have trick or treating, Will parents allow their kids to trick-or-treat? Will people give out candy to trick-or-treaters? Watch for that as the next big controversy. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. Continue the conversation on Twitter and on Facebook and watch every episode at WOSU.org. For our panel and for our crew, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.